Toast for breakfast. Went and put the bread in the toast, but that was mouldy. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I had more bread, bread in the freezer, so again, it wasn't a problem, but it's just one of those things. So, as I say, it's one of those days. But uh, Psalm 118, verse 24, reminds us that this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, I think that is a, a good reminder that every day belongs to God. And we can sing about that this morning. We're going to do that. It's song number 398. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. There you go. The words are up on the screen. We're going to sing along together. <laughs> and answers, where dissonant voices ignite division, my heart will stand firm in this decision. I choose thankful. Though I walk through a landscape that is uncharted and foreign, where the once familiar seems lost and forgotten, I will remember that nothing is unexpected to my Father in heaven, and I choose thankful. Though I live each day uncertain of tomorrow, I will accept that tomorrow was never certain and cherish every chance to witness the wonder of creation. I choose thankful. I choose faith in what is unseen, hope for a future beyond the adversity, 
Love spoken despite animosity. I choose to believe. And though the struggles I face may be painful, though it sometimes seems impossible, though I fall a thousand times covered in the dust of failure, I am able to rise. Not because I am strong, not because life is perfect, but because in all circumstances, Jesus lives. When this world stands perplexed and demands I give a reason for the hope that I have, I can only say that in Jesus' name, I choose thankful. It's not a simple choice. It's not an easy choice, but it is the only choice that brings calm in the storm. Not by my power, but through the strength of Christ alone. I choose thankful. I choose to be thankful for the things that the Lord has given us. We're going to turn to prayer just now, and to aid us in that, we're going to look at uh, sing song number three hundred and ninety-five. I have changed the tune to something that perhaps you might be more familiar with than the one that's listed in the Salvation Army songbook. Three hundred ninety-five says, "Thank you, Lord, for all your goodness through the years of yesterday. Thank you too for present mercies and your blessing on my way. Thank you for each revelation." and for what you choose to hide. Thank you, Lord, for grace sustaining as I in your love abide. And we're actually going to sing to the tune of Burning, Burning. Let's sing these words together just now. <laughs>
sing when you think about it. Thank you, Lord, for those prayers which you've granted. Thank you, too, for the prayers you've denied. That's a difficult <coughs> thing to say. Let's pray together just now. Everlasting Father, wonderful Counselor, you are the almighty God, you're all-knowing, you're all-seeing. Nothing is hidden from you. Even darkness is as plain as light before you. And we praise you today for who you are and for the things you do. We approach your throne of grace today in the multitude of your mercy. I know that you know my ways, Lord. And I don't want to be wise in my own eyes. And I think that would go for each one of us this morning. That we would ask that you lead us today. That you give us guidance and direction, clarity and wisdom into your truth. That you would order our steps by your Holy Spirit's power. That our choices be guided by your word. And let us not try and get ahead of you. So we ask for your guidance and your direction today. Guide us in your love and lead us in your light that we might not fall into temptation or that darkness might overtake us. Lord, I pray that you light my candle and enlighten my darkness. We pray for clarity in our situation. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you this day, to come into your house to praise you, to lift up your name, just to say thank you, Father, for all that you do and give to us each and every day. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to lift your name this morning, we will feel blessed having been here in this place. You will richly bless us, and that we'll bless each other in fellowship together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Over the mountains and the sea, your river flows with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the heathen set me free. Oh, 
the beat of your heart. So, Lord, keep me focused. Keep me focused on the plan that you have for my life. Teach me to dance to the beat of your heart. I'm just going to share um, <coughs> some words from Hebrews. Uh, these might be familiar, I'm not sure. Hebrews chapter 4. And at verse 14 we read these words. Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful, guiding, holy word spoken by you. Spoken by you, Lord, to the prophets. Spoken by the prophets. Spoken by Jesus, spoken by the apostles, and written down so that we may read it, we may learn from it, and we may be led. Continue to lead us, Lord, as we continue to worship you this day. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. You are working in this place.
So Lord, we remain committed to a relationship with you because you love us and in return we love you back. Your love is amazing. Our love is pretty weak. But Lord, you love us. 
And so we ask that you will really, really help us to focus on the plan that you have for our lives. Let's not just be blown away when any little thing comes along. Let's stay focused, Lord. Focus on the Saviour of the world, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, Holy One, the Lifter of our heads. Through you I come, the conquering Son, to my Father in heaven. Wow. What a privilege, what an honour to live for the <coughs> King of Kings. Continue to lead us, Holy Spirit. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. It's a beautiful song, that, isn't it? A waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Just some of the many attributes of God. Because the song says, you are touching every heart. And uh, we're going to turn to Scripture just now. And hopefully the Lord will touch our hearts through the reading of his word this morning. It's Proverbs 3, verses 1 to 6. And it talks about keeping God's commands in our hearts. It says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favour and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Amen. Amen. There are many wonders, great wonders in this world, but certainly one of the most beautiful and challenging is a um, labyrinth, a maze that's in Italy, uh, near Venice. It's called the, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I know, the Villa Pisani Labyrinto. Okay? It's designed by Girolamo Friglavellica in the early 1700s. If I'm wrong with the pronunciation, tell me afterwards. Okay? Sounded good to me. Thank you. Thank you. It's a classical, medieval, uh, Circular maze, it's got nine concentric patterns and uh, it's got lots and lots of dead ends as well. It was so intimidating and challenging that local legend would have you believe that Napoleon, who lived in that villa for a while, uh, got lost in this uh, particular labyrinth when he lived there. And uh, back in 1934, Hitler and Mussolini were visiting for a meeting and uh, apparently they were too chicken to go into the maze at all. That's, that's what our local legend puts it anyway. So what makes this one of the most difficult mazes in the world uh, to navigate is not only its intricate pathways, but also its hedges that are too dense to, uh, to go through and too high to see over. I don't know if you've ever been in a maze like that, but uh, when you get lost in them, they can get quite scary. This maze reminds me of the never-ending, unknown, almost infinite pathways of life that we as Christians have to navigate. Life is, a, sorry, living I should say, is an interconnected world of constant texting, <coughs> internet browsing and international news. One is constantly being bombarded with <coughs> so many voices of choices if you like that knowing with certainty which is the right path to seek and to take almost seems to be an exercise in futility. And while the world would have us chase after money, fame or power, that makes little difference really, or sense, considering that such endeavours are temporary and of little value when considering the eternity that God has placed in our hearts. Scripture states that the overall goal of life is to please God by striving towards becoming spiritually mature and attaining the full measure of Christ. And if you find that hard to believe, look up Ephesians 4, verse 13. So while we know finding the right path to life, um, sorry, while we know finding the right path to take in the maze called life 
is found from much prayer to prepare one's heart to listen to God's often gentle whisper and command to go and serve in his name. Many believers aim, well, they go aimlessly through life. They wander, perhaps because they're too enamoured with their own path that seems so right in their own eyes. I don't know. We're going to look at three people in Scripture who said yes to God. The first one is Joshua. He was called by God to lead God's people, the children of Israel, to take the promised land. It had been 40 years since he and the other 11 spies had first surveyed the land in Numbers 14. And while it truly was a land filled with milk and honey, Joshua still remembered both him and Caleb turning their clothes in disgust because the other spies saw the size of the people and the fortified cities and they thought, no, we can't do this. We can't go there. We can't follow God's plan. So as Joshua came near to the city of Jericho, some 40 years later, he looked up and saw the commander of the Lord's army standing before him with a drawn sword. Joshua fell face down in reverence. He removed his sandals because he realised he was standing on holy ground. And, uh, and he was trying to intently listen to what the Lord had to say about conquering Jericho. The Lord told him that Jericho had in reality already been handed to him if he followed his plan of judgment upon the nation. So for six days he would have to have the army march around the walls of the city and have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day they were to march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. Up until this time, Joshua had been told not to say a single word until they heard a long blast on the trumpets. And then they were to shout and the walls of the city would collapse. It seems hard to believe, but this is what the Lord told Joshua to do. And this is what they did. He could have devised his own plan, I'm sure, to conquer the city of Jericho. But he chose to trust God instead. And God came true on his promise. Like Joshua, often the path that God presents for our lives may not seem wise by human standards, but in faith will lead to pleasing him, which is the reason for which we exist. Now Joshua said no to God when he saw the giants in the land of Canaan. Would he not have perished like all the other Israelites who lacked faith? So if you like, the choices that we make in life, they matter to God, don't they? Let's think of somebody else. Elijah. Um, you can read his story in 1 Kings chapter 16. And in verse 30 of that chapter it says, Because King Ahab had done more evil in the eyes of the Lord than those before him, God told Elijah to announce his wrath upon Israel. He said, no dew or rain in the next few years. And then he told Elijah to flee to the uh, Kerith Ravine, where God instructed ravens to bring in bread. Which they did, until the brook dried up, and then he was told to move on to the well of Zarephath in the region of Sidon, and request food from a widow. Now you might be familiar with this story. When Elijah saw the widow gathering sticks, he asked her for something to drink and a piece of bread to eat. And she explained to Elijah that all she had was a handful of flour and a little bit of oil. And that was it. And she was going to use that to prepare a last supper for her and her child before they died. Which sounds really, really bad. But anyway, the prophet told her, don't be afraid, for if she granted this request to take care of the servant of God, the jar of flour would never run out wouldn't be used up. And the jug of oil wouldn't dry, run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Now what would you say if someone asked you to do that? If that was the request from God. To 
put others first at the expense of your own well-being or your family's well-being. When God asks us to walk in faith, to do something that requires the miraculous, how many times does our human foolishness get in the way of his ways that are so much better than our own? In essence, Elijah was asking the widow to trust God, to lean not upon her own understanding, but to trust God. The widow in this story gave the prophet of God her last meal. And in doing so, not only did she have food to eat every day, but also when her son became ill and died, Elijah cried out to the Lord and he was raised from the dead. And the widow said no to Elijah's request. Would she not have prepared that last meal and both her and her son died shortly after? Now while you're unlikely to be asked for such a thing, to make a physical life and death decision, does not every broad path that we take in life not seem to lead to spiritual defeat or darkness? Because we've missed the mark to please God. As I say, the choices we make in life, they matter to God. One other person I want us to think about this morning. Now, when Napoleon navigated the maps <coughs> in Villa Pisani, he probably felt he was going in the right direction until he hit numerous dead ends and he realised he'd lost all sense of direction. So life is a sea of never-ending choices. And when we feel we're the masters of our own destiny, that's when we're wandering away from the Lord. A good example of that in, in Scripture is the Apostle Paul. By his own admission, Paul believed he'd advanced in Judaism beyond many of his own age, and he was extremely zealous for Jewish tradition. In fact, at the time, Paul was so convinced his love to protect the temple and the Torah and so on, was the right path to take, that when Christ announced entry into the kingdom of God was based solely on faith in a risen saviour, he rejected the Son of God's path. He persecuted the church. For example, in trying to make his path right, Paul went from one synagogue to another. This is when he was still Saul, I should point out. And if the Christians would not blaspheme the Son of God, he had them put into prison. And he often casted his vote to have them put to death. It wasn't until he heard the words of the Lord, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That he repented. He accepted the Lord's mission for his life, which was ironically to preach the good news to the Gentile and Jewish people in the face of them persecuting him. From Paul we learn how important it is to be constantly listening to and allowing God to change our goals and dreams in life. In the maze of life's never-ending choices, we often get confused, we get turned around and we get heading for a spiritual dead end how desperately we need to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd who leads and guides us on the right paths for his name's sake. I wonder what would have happened if Paul said no to the Lord on the road to Damascus. He might have lived a famous, rich life. He might have continued as a well-respected Pharisee. But he wouldn't have testified to kings of the good news of Jesus Christ, nor would he have had the privilege of planting so many churches, or even running the race well and receiving crowns of righteousness. So as I say, the choices we make in life, they matter to God. The maze of life is filled with never-ending, unknown, almost infinite pathways that we have to navigate. Let us not take life merely as it happens or follow the many voices of choices that this world has to offer. God has placed eternity in our hearts 
so that we might look up and see the one who alone enables us to go on our uniquely defined path that he's in advance prepared for us to take. From Joshua we learned that whatever task God asks us to do, we're to humbly but with great confidence obey him. For what God speaks, he enables, he makes happen. For the widow we learned how important it is to have faith, that since God's ways are greater and better than our own, when asked to serve others at the expense of our own well-being, we are to trust and obey his call for our lives. Because that's always the right choice. And from the Apostle Paul, we learn how important it is to make course corrections when God asks us to. Like Paul, we often get so enamoured with trying to be the masters of our own destiny that when God asks us to take another route, we defiantly refuse and end up going against him. Praise God that no matter how lost we may be in the labyrinth of life, no matter how defiant our choices against God might be at times. If we humble ourselves and repent, God will not only find us, will give us, but he'll find us in the darkest, deepest pits that our choices have thrown us into and place us once again on a sure foundation. The path, the right path, that is truly a holy and sweet fragrance. Amen. 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 We're going to sing again. Oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. Sometimes life does throw us a curveball and that pathway takes us in places and directions perhaps we wouldn't have expected to go. But we can always trust God to be there with us. We're going to sing this to the tune of Haverfrock Castle. There normally, I think, is an introduction to this. Are you playing the introduction? Yeah. yeah. It's, written, <laughs> it's written really quite well, long. So. Yes. So the verse is like, Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So once we're in, we're in, we're singing the four <laughs> verses. Yeah. Yeah. And I think because of the version, of the, uh, the tune, we sing the last two lines of the fourth verse twice. To finish, yeah. To finish. Okay. Let's sing together. Just now. Jesus, I have promised. Two.
stay seated. Let's pray. <coughs> oh Lord, <coughs> let me hear thee speaking in accents clear and still above the storms of passion. And sometimes, Lord, there are those storms of passion in our lives where perhaps <coughs> we do have disagreements with others. Those and those murmurs of self-will where we think to ourselves, you know what, Lord, my will is overriding yours today. And sometimes, Father, that that's comes so overwhelming for, for us that uh, it's so difficult, perhaps, to put you first. But we just ask, Lord, that you will speak to reassure us, to, to just take hold of us when you need to take hold of us, to control us when you need to control us. Speak to make me listen Thou the guardian of my soul. Life at the time, sorry, life at times, Lord, it gets messy. It gets complicated. It does feel at times like we're in a labyrinth and we seem to be lost with no way out. I just pray, Father, that when those situations arise, help us to remember that you're still with us. You haven't left us. You haven't forsaken us. You haven't left us to try and get out of the maze on our own. You are there as our constant companion and friend and guide. And so I just pray, Father, that in all situations, we will uh, realise that you are there with us, our never-failing friend and saviour. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And we pray that as we continue to do that just now, you'll continue to bless us and you'll receive a blessing through our worship today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We shared from Hebrews 4 earlier, and in the same chapter we read these words, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. Thank you. 
What a beautiful, beautiful truth. Jesus Christ, Holy One, the lifter of our heads. Through you I come, conquering sin, to my Father in heaven. And I'm confident that I belong to you. As the Spirit testifies, I have no fear. Fear has no hold. So I cry, Abba Father, what mercies you have poured on me. Wow. And Lord, in your word, we share these words at the end of our service. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. God's name is a place of protection. Good people can run there and be safe. God's name is a place of, a, of protection. Good people can run there and be safe. So Lord, we stand here or sit here or whatever we're doing at this moment, Lord, before you. <coughs> and we proclaim that you know the truth to be born again. For that is what is needed to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Lord, we come before you as a people who have repented, a people who have bowed down, a people who have been born again and are now part of the family of God through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Holy One. Lord, that is such a wonderful privilege, such an honour to be part of your family, the family of God. And of course, Lord, as we live here on earth, we are aware that Jesus could return at any time. That time is only known to you, God. So I pray that we're ready. Ready for that time. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have an amazing week with Jesus and may God bless you all abundantly.